Yes. Morning. Good morning. So, um, you were talking about postmodernism. What were you saying? Uh, well, you know, obviously the idea of the postmodern is, is uh, it's been going on for half a century almost, the discussion about postmodernism. And it's, uh, I mean, I think depending on in which country you are, it looks different. If you're in France, Germany, Sweden, US, England, it looks different because there are different traditions where you would discuss this term. But I think uh, I mean, also recently the term has become like a, a, a blanket term for everything which is bad, irrational, confusing, reactionary, etc. And I think, it, I think the term deserves to be accounted for in a more precise historical way. And I mean, there are, there, are, there are uses of the term that go back already to the beginning of the 20th century to historians and, and art historians. But I think the crucial, the crucial moment when the term was introduced was, was the American art critic and historian Leo Steinberg, who, who, who gave a talk, I think, at the MoMA in New York in 1968, where he used the term post-modernism. And he was the talk was called Other Criteria, and then it was published a couple of years later in a book called Other Criteria. I mean, Steinberg was, was predominantly a classical art historian who worked on the Renaissance and Michelangelo and other things, but he occasionally he would speak about contemporary art. In, in that particular moment, he was discussing Robert Rauschenberg, and he was saying that, you know, in, in, in Renaissance painting, or in, in, as it were, painting up to the early modernist period, you would understand the, the, the you will understand that the pictorial plane is a kind of window, you know, from Alberti onwards. It is a window through which you see something. And the central perspective is, of course, of course, derived from that idea from Alberti in the 15th century. And this idea of the transparency, or as it were, the window-like quality of the picture plane has always been an obsession in painting. And it's specifically so in early modernist painting, when painters began to, you know, to, to question this transparency, we say perhaps a certain opacity, the brush strokes, the, the pigment, the canvas, the materiality of the canvas somehow um, became a new issue. It's how to deal with the fact that it, it is not entirely transparent, how to use the opacity as a means to, to create something new. So that's, as Steinberg said, there was a kind of you know, dialectic between the transparency and the opacity of the picture plane. Picasso and early modernists, blah, 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 blah. And that went on and, 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 and he said, but all of that was a kind of game played within a, a certain rules, right? And, uh, and even though you could uh, at, some, at some point say, well, the, the picture plane is entirely op opaque, you still play the game within the same rules, in the same rules. But with Rauschenberg, and I mean, he, 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 he I mean, he suggests Rauschenberg, you can surely find other painters, but, but he said, in Rauschenberg, there, something happens, and, and this plane is now tilted to 45 degrees. So we don't perceive this as something that encounters the eye in, like this, but as something which is lying down. So the question is not whether something where you can see through the picture or not, but what you put on it. And I guess you know, uh, you know, Jackson Pollock would have been perhaps a more obvious, <laughs> obvious example. But I mean, um, Pollock was already uh, he was already, as it were, taken by Clement Greenberg, so he could use Pollock. But he used Rauschenberg. He said that he tilts the plane and he puts stuff on it, cigarette ends, you know, pours coffee, paint, uses it as a kind of dumping ground for things. And he says this is now rather than flatness. And this is, of course, a reference to Clement Greenberg. Now, flatness was the flat quality of the picture plane, which was really a, a key term in this dialectic of the, of the picture plane. Rather than flatness, you have a flatbed. A flatbed is, is a term for a printing process where you have something at the bottom where all the dust and uh, stuff is collected. <laughs> the, the, the trash in the printing process ends up at the flatbed. So it's really, it's a term that people wouldn't know. I mean, I never heard the word flatbed until I looked it up in the dictionary. But the flatbed is of course a metaphor. It is it, somehow plays with the Greenbergian f flatness, but also produces this idea of the dumping ground. He says, when this becomes a new gambit of painting, the new rule, we are no longer within modernism, but within something that we could refer to as postmodernism. But that was in 1968. Mm. And from that onward, of course, this term spread, you know, and all other ways. I mean, the idea of flat, but it's one thing, there were many other ideas. But I think the, the term postmodernism, when it began to be used in the 70s, specifically in the American art context, was 
to describe various ways in which new art broke with the modernist paradigm of the painting sculpture not divide that was so strong in Clement Greenberg. So postmodernism became a way to talk about contemporary art and, and uh, from, from that it also spread you know dance that was a very strong emphasis on the postmodern early dance theory so, so it's, it's a postmodernism that has to do with the overcoming or the critique of a certain idea of modernism as a formalism in art theory or in art criticism and and, and uh, I mean all these debates that 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 occurred around minimalism and conceptual art and all this you know, performance and, and happenings or whatever. I mean the term postmodernism existed but it wasn't used that widely. There were other terms uh, available to discuss that. They were more frequently used but when you know, Michael Fried, one of the major protagonists in this drama, looked back to the late 60s, early 70s, he, he would say, well, we use different terms but now the term postmodernism is the one that we use to describe that. And he, and he, of course he hated postmodernism in that sense. But in that sense it is a very specific thing that has to do with the visual arts and dance, choreography to some extent. So that's one story of the postmodern, which has to do with you know, the visual arts. The other, the other story, which is like 10 years later, is, is, is I think connected of course with the very famous book by Jean-François Lyotard, the French philosopher, called The Postmodern Condition, which is a really different story. He would also write about art a lot, but he would not at all refer to Steinberg or to that kind of discussion. I mean, later, eventually, a little bit, but I mean, he, that was not at all his, his proposal. This grew out of a, a fairly, I don't know the exact details, but you know, he would describe this as the worst book I ever wrote. <laughs> and he said, really? yeah, 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 my worst book ever. <laughs> and he was you no. Know, he felt really bad that this this book made him famous because he, he, he then had to you know, defend this idea of the postmodern in all, all various contexts. So I think it, to some extent it ruined his career. <laughs> well, not ruined, really, he became very famous, but he had to somehow defend this idea that was just just an aside for him. You know? But he was he, he was uh, 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 he was asked by I think the University of Quebec or Montreal, I don't remember now, to write something called a report on knowledge. Uh, a report on knowledge, which is a very bland title. Rapport sur le savoir is, is, a, is the French title. Um, and they wanted him to survey, you know, the, the status of university research, the sciences, what is the... I mean, how does science, how does knowledge look today in the late, in the late 70s? And he would... He would uh, so, in about... 100 pages, he, he surveys various discourses on our sociology, the knowledge, theory of science, political science, etc., etc., and, and he says that, well, there seem to be some major changes occurring after the Second World War. I mean, earlier he said we were largely, uh, at least from a philosophical point of view, we, we somehow believed what he calls the, you know, the great narratives, the grand stories, les grands récits, which is like the discourse of emancipation, the discourse of universality, the discourse of, of the university as a place where, where all, all knowledge could be gathered together into a systematic whole. Now we don't believe that anymore, he said. We don't think that there is one story to be told, one great narrative. And you can of course connect that to the founding of the Berlin University and to Hegel and to Marx and all kinds of philosophers. He said, today we live in, in a much more fragmented landscape and, and we don't have one story. We have you know, very many small stories. And, and he said, this is it poses new problems. It poses new problems for the philosophy of science, it poses new problems for the philosophy of politics, for ethics, because you have to live with the fact that we live in many stories and, and the question becomes how should we mediate and create relations between fields of knowledge that appear to be so you know, far apart. I mean how can we connect quantum physics to literary theory to political discourse? How can you do that? It's, it, you can't do that by simply imposing one way of speaking. We should speak in that way. We have to speak in many ways. Mm -hmm. So for him I think the postmodern condition as he called it was there's a new condition and we have to, it's not good or bad, it's just the way it is and we have to find new tools to navigate in this weird universe. And, and the thing is that he was at least partially sometimes perceived as being like in favor of irrationality. You know, we should, we should now everything breaks up, everything is fragmented. He was saying, you know, that the, the old stories are, are, no longer, are no longer useful. We need to invent new stories and new ways to link them. And in fact, he was looking back, he was looking back to Immanuel Kant, 
that was his claim. You know, he said he wrote a, a sh small essay in 1984, I think. It's called "Answer to the Question: What is the Postmodern?" And this is, in fact, a ironic reference to an essay by Immanuel Kant 200 years before. Uh, <laughs> answer to the question: What is enlightenment? Mm. Uh, and Kant said that enlightenment is a new universality, or he says it's a new idea of the publicness of knowing it is a new way of being able to think for yourself and speak for yourself, etc., etc. I think Lyotard's essay said that now we are, we have continued the Enlightenment, but we have continued in such a way that the, that the unifying principles that were at the, at, at the basis of Kant's philosophy, we don't believe in them. So it's Enlightenment turning against the self. And so he was perceived as being counter-Enlightenment, which, uh, yeah, of course, but I mean, he was saying, I think we should read it in this way, that he was saying that we need to pursue the, the Kantian question beyond the particular claims that Kant made in the late 18th century, which are no longer credible, I mean, strictly speaking. I mean, no one believes literally that Kant was right today. The sciences look different, for instance. But we need to pursue that kind of question. So, so the, this was a question of, of questioning the Enlightenment, or as it, as it were, how shall I put it, Enlightenment against itself. But it was absolutely not a, a claim for any kind of new irrationality. So that's the second version, which is not connected to this story about the visual arts or the flatness. It's a completely mm -hmm. different story. And, and then you have the third one, which How I think. How many are there? I would say there are three major ones. And then, they, of course, they have been combined. And, you know, and, and mm -hmm. the postmodernism is the culture and logic of late capitalism. And he says that in late capitalism, which for him, perhaps also after the Second World War, to some extent. Late capitalism is a situation where uh, older forms of aesthetic and, and uh, artistic and philosophical and political expressions are no longer useful because we live in a different world. And he describes postmodernism by drawing on many of the features of the other stories, no fragmentation, a new type of, new type of surface, a kind of loss of depth, and a kind of loss of traditional coherence. But he sees that as, as simply the effect of a new phase of capitalism. You had the early phase, you had the phase of monopoly capitalism, and then you have the phase of, as it were, late capitalism from after the Second World War. And, and this produces new aesthetic responses, you know, like pop art, conceptual art, new types of philosophies. But he, he, he produces a grand Hegelian narrative, you know, in, in stages. So he's saying that, well, we are in this postmodern condition. It, it should not be, you know, applauded nor rejected. It's simply a new phase of history and we need to find this is as new cartographies to, to locate ourselves in the postmodern universe. So in that sense he, he, he is really producing one big narrative whereas Lutar is opposing new narrative. So, so he's a, he has a kind of Hegelian version, the grand story, whereas Lutar has a Kantian version, no there are no great stories, whereas the art, art theoretical one is really a small thing. And these stories have been or these reversions have been merged and blurred and, and sometimes they pass over into each other. But I think a, it would be useful to, if one discusses whether this term is, should all be used, which version of it you're actually proposing. And what I would say is, is that all of these problems are of course still with us today. I mean all of the problems that were, that were broached by, by art critics in the late 60s and 70s, all the problems posed by Leo Tarr and also the problems posed by Jameson, they are still relevant. But it's not perhaps relevant to somehow summarize them under one term. Because mm -hmm. that creates the illusion that postmodernism is this one thing you have to embrace or reject. It was simply a kind of umbrella concept for, you know, for very many problems. And they are still relevant. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, perhaps one should stop speaking about postmodernism or postmodern and speak about the problems, because they are still with us. And I mean, this, you know, these, uh, as it were, this fragmentation of the unified narratives that have gone on through post-colonial theory, feminist theory, a lot of other the theories that have come. And they are, of course, you know, continuing that kind of discussions. But it doesn't make any sense to, sense to say that they're all postmodern. Because what, I mean, what you actually discover, and this has been one of the favorite pastimes of art historians, is of course that one, okay, there was perhaps this break in the 60s, but it already began in the 50s and the 40s. You can, you can somehow rediscover that the things that, that were at, at one point perceived to be breaking with modernism were in fact a substantial part of modernism early on. So, so this is a kind of redistribution of those features back into history. So, so the idea of a break at some point perhaps is 
not particularly useful today anymore. Mm. So the term, we may keep the term for sentimental reasons, because I, when I grew up, you know, when I started becoming intellectual in the early, in the early 80s, you had to be postmodern, of course, because it, it was a new thing. Today, the concept means very little to me. Mm. Post-postmodern. We're post-postmodern, or we, we are simply within, as it's some people say, we're still within modernity in some sense. And, and there's no real break here at some point with, with the past. It makes really no sense. Perfect.